Hey everyone, in the past two months I haven't uploaded, I got a gun pulled on me It was almost killed, did an interview on Anthony Padilla's channel which you can find in the description, and also finally released some music which some of you know I've been doing behind the scenes for years. And you guys have been supporting it so much, I, I can't say how much I appreciate it. Sorry my voice is messed up, I'm off my meds. I feel like there's a clear disconnect between my supporters on YouTube and my supporters on Twitter and Instagram. It almost feels like I'm two different people, again. The people on those platforms see so much more of me than people on YouTube, as well as some bonus content from other stuff I do. If you'd like to interact and get to know each other better, both Instagram and Twitter are at corpse underscore husband. If you send me a tweet right now that says hi, I'll like it, I promise. Anyways, if you're just here for the stories, ignore all of that and let's get into it. I'm a male and was about 21 at the time this happened. I was working at a restaurant as a manager. I had worked from 6pm the previous night. We did stock take after our shift ended, which involved the owners locking three people in the restaurant overnight to count and log all the stock in the kitchen and letting them out the next morning because nobody else had keys to the place. I was supposed to go home after the shift ended. And another manager would do the stock take, but she had an emergency and seeing as the owners insisted a manager had to be present, I got stuck with working from 6pm to about 8am the next morning when I was relieved by the next manager. I was pretty bummed, but the owners agreed to pay me overtime and give me an extra day off. They also left us steaks and fries to eat. I only left the restaurant at about 9am the next morning. The owners were there sooner, but I spent time talking shit and chatting with my friend who was the manager for that morning shift. I was walking to the bus stop as I didn't have a car yet and was saving up for one and I was exhausted. I had gotten a bit of sleep in after the stock take while we waited for the owners but it was on a bench at a booth and not very comfortable. I'm usually a very vigilant person and the neighborhood I had to walk through was pretty sketchy, but usually only at night and at this point I could barely keep my eyes open and my biggest worry was falling asleep on the bus and missing my stop. I was about four blocks from the restaurant and the bus stop was in sight when I saw a man rapidly approaching me from across the street. He was wearing old washed out jeans, a shirt that I presume used to be white but was now a yellowish brown, and an old baseball cap with the logo torn off. I immediately thought he was either going to ask me for money to buy drugs or to offer to sell me drugs. That was just the type of area this was. Before I could open my mouth to tell him I wasn't interested, he went into this whole tirade about how he's a delivery truck driver and that he needed help offloading a large delivery because he was working alone that day and that he would pay me. I told him no thank you and that I'm not interested. I'm tired and that I want to go home. I started towards the bus stop again, but he kept pace with me, pleading the whole time. Please man, I need your help. If I don't get this delivery done ASAP, my boss is going to kill me. I kept telling him no, I wasn't interested. When I finally reached the bus stop there was another man standing there and the delivery guy seemed to lose interest in me mid-sentence and tried to sell his story to the other guy. The guy at the bus stop was a well-dressed black man and I was waiting for him to tell the driver to get lost, so imagine my surprise when he seemed interested in the whole thing. He walked away with the driver and they were talking just out of earshot. Whatever, not my problem anymore. Then the well-dressed guy turned back and walked towards me. He said, Hey, listen man, this guy really needs help and he's willing to pay. He says the place is just around the corner, but this is a dodgy neighborhood and I'm not sure I could trust him. Could you please come with me? He says we can get a hundred bucks each for less than an hour's work. If he's lying, he can't take both of us on. And if he's telling the truth, it's an easy hundred bucks. Now, when I heard a hundred bucks for less than an hour's work, I was interested. Don't judge me, I really needed the money because I was saving up for a car so I wouldn't have to take the bus every day or rely on friends for a ride. Also, this other guy was with me now, so I'll be okay if the driver tries anything funny, right? At least, that's what my tired brain said. How wrong I was. So, we returned to the driver and told him we would do it. If the fact that there were two of us now put him off, he didn't show it. Which did even more to put my mind at ease. As we started walking, I asked the guy, so, a hundred each, right? Why so much for so little work? Oh, yeah, we were supposed to have a team to help me, and my boss gave me the money to pay them after the job was done, but they bailed last minute. Now I really need to get this delivery done and my boss is on my case, so I decided seeing as I have the cash, I'll get volunteers to help me and pay them instead. But there's two of us, why would you have money for a team if just two people can do it in under an hour? 
The man kind of stuttered a bit before finally saying, Oh, you know what these contractor companies are like. I didn't know, but decided to just keep my mouth shut and focus on getting myself physically ready for more work even though I was exhausted. Like I said, I really needed the money for a car. The well-dressed man remained quiet the whole walk and I assumed he was just suspicious and trying to stay alert. We're here, the driver said. Here was an old car dealer that looked closed between two run-down empty buildings. They look closed, I said stupidly. The delivery area is open, the driver replied quickly. Security here is very strict. You'll need to show me everything you have on you and give it to me so security can check it in. The driver laughed. The well-dressed man handed over his wallet and phone while I stared dumbstruck. The driver quickly disappeared in a small alley between the dealership and one of the buildings. It was cluttered with junk so you couldn't see very far inside of it. He was to go round back to security. I was baffled. How can this man give his valuables to a complete stranger just like that? The same man who told me he didn't trust this situation and asked me to come along to make sure it's all okay? Not even a minute later, the driver came back and handed back the man's valuables. Then he looked at me. Your turn, was all he said with a smile. Look, I'm sorry, but no, I, I can't do that, I said, as both of them stared at me intently while my mind was still trying to process the situation. Oh, you don't trust me? Is that it? Even after I brought back all of his stuff? The driver chuckled while motioning to the other guy, who also chuckled. What are we delivering here anyway? I asked, desperately trying to buy time while my mind tried to figure out what exactly was happening here. The driver's smile disappeared as I could see the question caught him off guard. Um, fire extinguishers. Before I could reply, he changed the subject again. If you don't trust me, that's fine. Come with me and show them to security yourself. His smile was back on his face, but his eyes were not smiling. I was already uncomfortable, but this was it. There was no way I was going to walk with this guy I didn't know down that dingy alley behind the building where nobody could see us. I looked at the well-dressed man and he just smiled and said, Do it. It's okay. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm out. I said, trying to walk away. The driver grabbed my arm firmly, his smile gone now. Just come with me. It will just take a minute. He almost growled while the other guy stepped closer, but didn't move to help me. At this point, my tiredness was completely gone and my brain was in overdrive. Now I'm tall, I'm six foot four, but I'm slim. Fit, but very slim, and with my height, it gives me a very lanky appearance, not intimidating at all. Besides, I highly doubted I could take both of them at once, especially with them so close to me. I was in full fight or flight though, so I did what I usually do when I can't intimidate someone with my physical appearance. I intimidate them by making them think I'm batshit crazy and unstable. Nobody wants to fight a crazy person from my experience. I screamed, don't you touch me, at them. And in doing so, I basically screeched at them. This worked and completely caught them off guard and I saw them hesitate. I yanked my arm from his grip and started spouting curses and obscenities, trying my best to act like a deranged madman. Then I bolted mid-sentence before they knew what was going on. They made no move to follow me or call after me. When I looked back, both of their faces were expressionless and cold, just staring at me. When I slowed and glanced back again to make sure they weren't following, they were still standing there, staring at me with those same expressions. Except now, three other men had come out of the alley the driver wanted me to walk into. None of them looked like security guards, and they all just stared at me with those same cold, blank faces, completely still like statues. I've had a lot of time to reflect on this incident in the years since, and in hindsight I realized red flags should have gone up a lot sooner. Those men were hiding in the cluttered alley waiting for me, and the well-dressed man was in on it, to make me feel more safe and comfortable because I had someone with me. Some people have told me I overreacted and it was all innocent, but I saw that man's face when he grabbed my arm. It was pure evil. Also, no car dealership of that size has a lot of fire extinguishers, especially not enough to warrant three people offloading them. A delivery like that would take 10 minutes tops for just one person. Anyways, I did get my car eventually, she's my pride and joy. 
I quit that job not long after and I never went to the police. My thoughts were I had nothing to give them except descriptions of the driver and well-dressed man, but I had no proof that any crime was committed. And even if they did catch the guys, they couldn't charge them with anything. I realize now they could have asked the dealership if there was CCTV or something, but even if they were just in jail overnight, that would be a night they couldn't hurt anyone. I might have saved someone from being mugged or even worse by doing that. Honestly, that part still haunts me. Hindsight is 2020, as they say. I'm a woman who currently lives in the downtown area of a generally very safe city. Since the start of the pandemic, I've been laid off from my job at the bookstore and have been staying inside. However, my micro apartment is about the size of a prison cell. It's only large enough to fit a bed, toilet, sink, and a tiny shower. So I have to go outside to exercise for my mental health. The night before last, I'd taken my bike out at 2 a.m. to cruise around. Knowing what happens next, going out at that hour was a stupid choice, but my sleep schedule is non-existent and 1 to 4 a.m. are my most active hours. I assure you though that I'm not going to be going outside at those hours for a very long while. I'm new to biking, being that nobody taught me how to ride them as a kid. So the complete lack of cars or any human life at all is helpful in terms of practicing. Like if I swerve, there are no children to knock over. Anyways, I had been cycling about the city for about half an hour, not having any specific destination, just kind of winding around the street blocks. It's surreal and eerie to see a main street completely empty when before the pandemic it had been covered with noisy cars at all hours of the night. When I got to the outdoor mall and plaza area, I decided to rest on a bench and scroll on my phone for a bit. About five minutes into my break, I start to hear what sounds like distant humming. It was many blocks away, so at first I thought it was my noise-accustomed city brain compensating for the silence. But as the sound grew clearer, I became aware that it was undeniably real. I didn't really think anything about it, and I didn't even look up until the person who was humming was only a few buildings away from me. My eyes had to adjust off the brightness of my screen to see a shadowy figure walking on the other side of the street. It was only until he walked into the light of a closed shop that I could make out any details. It was a pale man wearing a very tight all-black outfit that looked like a morph suit but without the head. He was humming a tune that I wasn't familiar with. His face was strangely froggish. This is when I began to get a little nervous. I grew up in a city with a high homelessness rate so I was used to seeing addicts act unusually because I knew that 99% of the time they're harmless. But this man didn't look homeless at all and his eyes weren't leaving me. I politely divert my gaze hoping he'll do the same. But when I look up a few seconds later, I see that he not only failed to break eye contact, but he was now crossing the street directly towards me. I pretended to be unbothered, scrolling on my phone, not letting onto the fact that I was tracking him in my peripheral vision. What the hell was he wearing a morph suit for? He stopped in front of the bench I was on and stopped humming. It's late, he said. A slow fear began boiling in my stomach. He wasn't saying it in a way that a concerned parent would. He was smiling and his hands were clasped behind his back. Uh, yup. I replied very uncomfortably, fretting about the fact that I hadn't got on my bike and taken off before he was able to even start talking to me. What happened to social distancing anyways? I pretended to check the time on my phone and said, Oh, it, it is late. I should be going. He stood there motionlessly as I picked my bike up off the ground and tucked my phone away. I glanced up at him. His weird smile had melted away and he looked like a toddler whose toy had just been stolen. Go where? He said. I didn't want to stay there any longer, so I mounted the bike and took off without answering. Now this is the detail where I'm a new bike rider comes in, because I didn't realize that tires being low on air was a thing. I know, stupid. And my bike doesn't go very fast. Only a little faster than a person can run. So I took off onto the road hoping to leave him behind. But to my dismay, from behind me the sound of shoes slamming against the pavement starts up. This guy is running after my bike. I begin to pedal as fast as I can. Go where, go where, go where, he was chanting. My heart was pounding ridiculously fast at this point, and I was thinking about what the hell to do. I looked for any signs of other people, but it seemed to be just us, some closed stores and hotels with completely empty parking lots. I sped through red lights knowing that I would just have to bike long enough to lose him. I was hoping that someone in the apartments above would hear this man chanting, look out their window and maybe call the police for me. 
hoping that a car would come up from behind us and force him to stop running after me in the middle of the street. His chanting is getting a little farther away, but it's not far enough for me to lose him. There's no way I could stop in my apartment, lock up my bike, unlock the door, and get to safety without him being able to catch up to me. Then it hit me that about 10 blocks away from where I was was a police station. Would anyone even be there? I didn't have any other ideas, so I passed the turn to my apartment and began pedaling to the station. My thighs were burning at this point because a bike with no air in the tires does pretty much none of the work for you. My stomach starts sinking as, slowly, the sound of souls on pavement and the sickening chanting of Go Where became steadily closer. I realize I'm slowing down even though my blood is pure adrenaline. I felt like crying. To the police station! I screamed back at him in hysterics as I continued to push forward. To my absolute surprise, the night goes silent. Not even the sound of his feet chasing after me, just my empty tires scraping on the pavement. I pedal forward a few more blocks before slowing to a stop. And looking back over my shoulder, he was just standing there in the shadowed street. I wasn't going to give him the opportunity to catch his breath. I pedaled as hard as I could, diverting from the police station and taking a separate path to get back to my apartment stopping every now and then to listen for the sound of shoes against pavement or the humming of a lunatic. When I get off my bike in my apartment building, I feel like I can't unlock the lobby door fast enough with my shaking hands. My head is spinning and I can feel my cheeks are flushed. I lock up my bike in my garage and go up to my apartment to collapse on my bed. I didn't even think about calling the cops at that point. I was just thankful that I hadn't been followed home. I seldom sleep well, but that day I couldn't sleep at all. This has not left my mind these past two days, and when I went out to jog this morning, I found myself constantly glancing around for a morph suit and my ears straining automatically, trying to catch the sound of far away humming. I don't know what would have happened if he caught up to me, but I'm so glad that I didn't have to find out. This kind of stuff literally never happens to me, and this is easily the creepiest thing that's ever occurred in my life. I swear when you're listening to these horror stories on YouTube, they seem separate from your reality a part of another person's life that could never happen to you. At least, that's how I felt until this happened. The two things I learned. One, don't go out alone at night in a completely empty city. And two, buy a damn tire pump. Okay, so backstory. I go to a high school with about 500 people. This happened during my sophomore year, and I'm a junior now. This might not be as extreme as other Let's Not Meet posts, but this is something that still terrifies me even a year later. Mark had other issues before this happened. He started cutting his arms in class. I was sitting two seats away from him and watched it all happen. He ended up being reported to the office and was sent to the YOC for about a month, if I remember correctly. The YOC is the Youth Opportunity Center. It's basically a mental hospital slash juvie center for kids. He came back and he seemed fine. He said he was never suicidal and that he only did it for attention, which made sense for him because of his kind of messed up childhood. On the day everything happened, I had no clue about anything. But during my sixth hour class, the school resource officer appeared at the door of the classroom. One of my friends was standing behind him. The SRO told my teacher that he needed me immediately. I had no clue what was going on. I just thought I was being randomly drug tested as it's pretty common in my school. I tried asking why we were going to the office and I got no response. He took the two of us into the conference room where two police officers were standing. They questioned me first. As I walked into the room, he shut and locked the door behind me. One of the police officers blocked the door, the other blocked the window. I was petrified. I had no clue what was happening. The conversation went as follows. Side note, the SRO was confrontational and aggressive throughout this entire conversation. Have you heard anything today? About what? There were threats made against our school. Your name came up in a conversation. What do you mean my name came up in a conversation? I haven't heard anything. Who made the threats? And who said I would know anything about it? Mark made the threats. When we questioned some other people, your name popped up. They said you might know something. Who said my name? We can't tell you. I understand that they probably couldn't tell me who said it due to confidentiality reasons, but it's so frustrating to be locked in a room with three police officers who are acting like you've done something wrong, especially when you haven't. To this day, I still have no clue who mentioned my name. 
I tell them I have heard nothing. The only class I have with him is fifth period, and he wasn't there today. We don't talk outside of that class, and the only reason we talk in that class is because we sit at the same table, so we have to work together some days. Are you sure? I'm positive. I don't know anything. All of this is news to me. Okay, you're free to go. They opened my door, took my friend in, and I went back to class. I was kind of in shock. As soon as I walked through my class door, everyone was bombarding me with questions about what had happened. I ignored them and put my head down for the rest of class. Later that night, I saw on Facebook that the school had posted a message. I don't remember what it was exactly due to it being deleted. From my recollection, it said something like this. Parents and students of my school. Two students reported that another student had made threats against our school. We have handled the situation and there's nothing to worry about. The actual post was longer, but I honestly don't remember it. I told my parents about everything that had happened that day, and they immediately wanted more information. I couldn't give it to them. At that point, I didn't know about the hit list or his arrest. All I knew was that someone had threatened to shoot up the school. The next day, everything hit the fan. I found out he had told people about his plans during first hour, and he was taken out of class and arrested during fourth hour. He was going to do it during fifth hour, start with the class he was in, which I was in too, and then he would head to the cafeteria. God, I still get chills when I think of this very moment. During lunch, my best friend came up to me and told me about the hit list Mark wrote and showed her during first hour. She didn't get the chance to tell me the day before. The other guy who was there confirmed everything. I was on it. I was the third name down. Evidently, he described in detail how he would kill me. Luckily, someone stopped it from happening, or else I would be dead before I even got to graduate high school. To this day, I still don't know why he would have possibly wanted to kill me. I barely even spoke to the guy. I was polite in class if I had to work with him, we had no negative interactions, so I honestly have no clue what I did to make him so desperately want me dead. As I understand it, he did have a gun in his locker. It wasn't a joke like his friends thought. He intended to do it. I was relieved that I was alive and that nothing happened, but I was also out of mind with horror at the thought of someone plotting my death. About two weeks later, my dad and I go into the Dollar General in our town. Keep in mind, my dad has no clue what Mark looks like. We walk in to buy something for dinner, and I see Mark. He's staring at me so intensely that I wanted to run out of the store, but I stuck close to my dad and told him to hurry. He looked at me confused, and I told him I would explain it later. Mark was following us around the store. I couldn't breathe. I don't even have the words to describe how scared I was. My dad and I got what we needed, left the store, and got in the truck. As soon as I was in the truck and the doors were locked, my dad turned to me and asked, Who was that? I replied that it was Mark. At this point, we were thoroughly panicked, not only because he was roaming free, but because he knew where I lived. I mean, we had security cameras, but knowing that a person who has adamantly expressed his desire to kill you knows where you live is terrifying. The school has since acted like this never happened. In fact, one of the administrators told me and my family we were overreacting when we wanted to know if he'd be back at the school because, according to them, I was never in any real danger. Luckily, the kid is no longer at my school, and he's currently in some type of jail because he murdered his mother. He pushed her down some stairs and she was found dead in a body bag. Thankfully, he was caught, and I don't think he's going to be getting out anytime soon.